Hey there drone fans, Rick here again from Drone Valley. In today's clip, I'll give you all the information you'll need to easily pass the brand new FAA trust test, which was only published a few days ago. Now this is an incredibly important test for any pilot in the US to both take and pass if you're flying a larger drone like this, which weighs more than 250 grams. If you're flying a smaller drone like these guys that are under the 250 gram weight limit, you won't have to take the test. Matter of fact, you won't even have to register your drone, but I'm going to suggest you take it anyway because it's jam-packed with a lot of really good information that any pilot should know, and I promise you it'll make you a better and a safer pilot. Plus, you may be flying a small drone today, you're going to get hooked on the hobby and want to upgrade to something bigger, and you've already passed the test. And this certificate's for life at this point, however long that lasts. So once you have your certificate, you can upgrade to a newer drone and not have to worry about it later on. So get out there and take the test. You're going to have a lot of fun with it. All right, so the way I'm going to organize this video is I'm going to start off talking about the test in general and give you some idea of exactly what the test involves, right? How long it's going to take you to do it, how many questions are on it, is it really difficult? And then I'll actually go through, not verbatim, but I'll go through each of the questions on the test and I'll give you some thoughts to keep in mind when you're taking the quizzes, because if you pay attention to that study guide, pretty much everything you need to know about the test is in that study guide. Now, again, I can't give you screenshots of the actual questions. I'm sure there are some knuckleheads out there. They're going to screen capture it and put a clip together and give you all the answers, but that's really defeating the purpose of it because it isn't one of those tests where they're looking to really bury you. Like a lot of the engineering classes I had, when you took a test, man, there were like, even if it was multiple choice, there were answers in there that were like, is it 35.35 or 35.53 or 53.53? It would drive you nuts because they were so close and they were they were looking to trip you up to make sure you really understood the material. This isn't one of those quizzes. Matter of fact, I'm going to make a bold statement here. You can't fail this quiz. You can't fail it. It's just that simple because it's multiple choice. There are typically three answers in there, or two answers if it's true or false, and you get to go back as many times as you want. And the best part is, when you're taking a quiz on that section, if you answer six of the questions right and miss one of them, it tells you which one you missed, so you already know one of the answers isn't correct, so just go back and take it again. And really what they're trying to do, more than punish you with a quiz or an exam, is they're trying to educate you as a pilot, because there are a lot of pilots that just get into the hobby, they buy a drone at Apple or Walmart or wherever they buy it, they go outside, put a battery in it, put it up, and have no idea of like the rules around flying it, and that's bad for the rest of us, because as a responsible pilot. I really enjoy this hobby. I love it. I'm out every day flying. Every time somebody does something because they don't understand there's certain regulations and rules about flying, it puts the rest of us at risk because they'll do something goofy. It'll cause a big deal. The news will hear about it. And all of a sudden the FAA has got to react to that. So take the test. It's super, super simple. And honestly, I promise you, I probably should do this, do this test is to start the test and take my little drinking bird up there and have it come down and hit the keyboard like on the Simpsons. And I'll bet if it did it enough times, it probably could pass the test for me. But take the test. All right. And the other thing I wanted to address before I get too deep into the material is I get a lot of grief for saying that these kind of things are not a bad idea. And I got grief for conversations around the registration of the drones, but I'm going to defend that a little bit. And I understand there are people out there that really feel like we as Americans have unbridled freedoms to do whatever we want. And who is the federal government to come in, the FAA to come in and tell us where and when we can fly our drones and put a test out that we have to pass? You have to take a step back from that for a minute and think about the responsibility of the Federal Aviation Administration. And I'm not, I'm not one of their folks that love to champion an organization like that because I know big government can be a headache. But in this case, if you're in charge of the national airspace and the FAA has got purview of everything from the grounds to the heavens, and their responsibility is not only to make that airspace safe, but to protect the public that's underneath all the stuff that's flying safe as well, They've got a heck of a job in front of them. Now, it's not that hard with larger aircraft because they've been around forever, but drones, these new sophisticated drones that can fly 10 miles, can fly thousands of feet in the air, can do all kinds of whiz-bang tricks up there, that's a brand new technology for them. It's a groundbreaking technology that quite honestly caught them by surprise. It caught all of us by surprise. I'm shocked that in five years we've gone to the level of sophistication available in these drones that consumers can buy. Um, they've got to they've got to protect that. And they've got to sort of figure out a way to integrate our wonderful hobby into the national airspace where airplanes are already flying, right? And there's more stuff coming once we get package deliveries and all kinds of autonomous flights. So as a responsible agency, they could have very easily said, look, we don't understand what these drones can do, so we're not going to let any drones fly in the national airspace over 25 feet in the air, which would really stink for us because I love putting a drone up and photographing lakes and forests and everything else from 200 feet in the air. So what they did instead was to say, we're going to integrate these slowly and carefully, and we're going to make sure the people that are flying them have some basic understanding of what the rules are for putting a drone aloft, and that's exactly what this exam does. Now, 
a lot of people are saying, well, where did the exam come from? We got a ton of emails this week about, hey, this came out of nowhere. It really didn't. If you looked at the FAA authorization bill or reauthorization bill a couple of years ago, there was a section in there that talked about a pilot competency test, which is exactly what this is. It's not a test to punish you. It's not a really hard exam. If you've ever taken a driving test, that's way harder. I took a driving test in high school. You had to study for weeks. You had a book that was 52 pages, had a lot of tricky questions on it. You're under pressure. The sweat's coming down your forehead. This is nothing like that. Trust me. This again is a test that you can't fail. All right, so let me get into it. All right, so before you start, a couple of things to keep in mind. Um, the quiz, as far as I can tell, is only available in English. So if you're a non-native English speaker, maybe it's your second language, have a buddy hang out with you when you're taking the test to read the questions in case you've got any confusion about it. I'm sure they're gonna probably publish in other languages. And if I miss that, I apologize, but I looked at pretty much all the offerings that were out there where you can take the test, and none of those were in English. I mean, none of those were non-English languages. The other thing is, <clears throat> be aware, like any time, a new thing comes out, the scammers descend on the internet like crazy. So when you do a search for the trust test, you're gonna get a lot of websites that are scam websites that are either trying to charge you to take the test or they're gonna charge you a lot of money for a class to help you take the test. Don't pay attention to any of those. I've got a link below that'll take you right to the FAA site. And on that site, there are 15 or 16 different companies that'll give you the test. It's free. You don't have to sign up for anything. You don't need your email. So don't fall prey to those scammers out there. The next thing is, I'll recommend you take it on a computer. You can take it on your phone, but the problem is some phones have pop-up blockers on them and you'll need to be able to get to the certificate at the end of the test. Also, some others can't, uh, they can't show you PDF files. They don't have a way to actually exhibit PDF files. And the problem is, with this test, when you get to the end of it, it'll generate a certificate that you have to download and print. I recommend you print it and also download it as a file on your phone so you've got it with you when you're flying. But the problem is if you're doing it on your phone and you can't have a pop-up come up or it can't read PDF, you'll get all the way through this particular test. You get to the end, you know you passed it with 100%, congratulations, but you can't actually get the certificate. So try and do it on a computer if you can, unless you know for sure your phone can handle that. The whole process, start to finish, about 15 minutes. It's 23 slides, and those slides are specifically targeted to the questions they're gonna ask you. There are four sections, so what you'll see basically is a bunch of slides, a question, or a bunch of questions. So if you understand those slides and understand the questions, you can pass that section easily, move on to the next section. The whole thing, again, 15 minutes. I think for me, because I was flying through it pretty quick the first time, because I'm like, all right, if I pretend I don't look at the slides, what can I do with the questions? I nailed them all 100% less than a minute per section. So it's if you're flying a lot and you understand the basic rules, you probably can skip through the slides, but I'm gonna suggest you read them at least because they're gonna prep you for the questions, but they'll also give you a lot of information that maybe you don't know. Maybe there are things in there that you're not aware of. Um, I also wanted to give you a metric, right? Because somebody like me that flies a lot and other pilots that are experienced, you'll get in there, take the test, and sure, it's a no-brainer for me, it's a layup. But I'm thinking, well, how hard would this be for a new flyer that's never flown before? So I had a friend take it who's never flown a drone. I said, look, just sit down, click that link, and start the test. It took them, start to finish, about 11 minutes. And all they did was read through the slides, six slides, took the question, six questions, moved on to the next section. So 11 minutes, start to finish, that's pretty cool. So 15 minutes, it's not that big a deal. And then the last thing is, I've said this already once, but I'll say it again to reinforce it, Make sure you save your certificate. Download that someplace you can hang on to it and you can print it again because you can't get it again. If you lose it, you gotta go back and take the exam again because the FAA doesn't have a record of it. The people that are giving you the test don't have a record of it. And they're doing that on purpose because they don't wanna collect any personally identifiable information on you. And normally when you take a test like this, you've gotta sign into a website, which means you've gotta create an account, give them some personal information, justify that your email is legitimate. And all that information being collected by a government agency scares a lot of people. So anyway, don't worry about that. You can take it, but definitely download it and save it. All right, so let me get into the test a little bit. So TRUST, what does that stand for? That's the Recreational UAS Safety Test. And really what it's all about is making you a better pilot, making sure you understand the uh, the rules of the air, so to speak. I'm a little bit troubled by the acronym. I've done a lot of work in engineering and marketing, and I don't know who came up with the TRUST acronym. It's a great acronym, but if you break it down, the T-R-U-S-T -T is, the first T is the, you never do that as part of an acronym, but the Recreational UAS, that's Unmanned Aerial System, which includes both the drone and the uh, controller, safety test. So the last T is test. So really it's a, you can't really say the trust test because the the trust test are right in there. And I know I'm splitting hairs, but that kind of stuff drives me nuts. But anyway, 23 slides, 23 questions in the test. Now I'm not going to go through each of these sections, but it's divided into four sections. And the first section talks about things like recreational flying. Understand, are you a recreational flyer or are you a commercial flyer? The easy answer is if you're flying for fun, you're a recreational pilot. 
If you're flying in any way to make money, you're a commercial pilot, which means you've got to pass a Part 107 exam. And curiously enough, even if you're a Part 107 certified, you still have to take the trust test. But that's the differentiation between the two, flying for fun or flying for money. Uh, airspace and restrictions, you need to understand that all airspace is regulated. But there are two types of airspace. So the FAA has got regulations over all the airspace, but there's both controlled and uncontrolled airspace. Now, controlled airspace is typically areas near sensitive installations like military facilities or power plants or airports, certainly, or if there's a, a big stadium that there's a game going on, that'll be controlled airspace. You can fly in both of those. Uh, uncontrolled airspace is everything else. And you can fly in both of those airspaces as a, as a recreational pilot, but if you want to fly in controlled airspace, you've got to get approval to fly there, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But it's important to understand that the FAA controls both of those types of airspace, but the controlled versus the uncontrolled really determines where you can fly and how high you can fly. Um, and you can find all that information by downloading a few really cool apps. Now, the one I use a lot is an application called Before You Fly, and it's the letter B, the number four, the letter U, and then fly. And if you download that, the minute you open it up, it gives you a hyper-local perspective of where you're standing. So it lets you know immediately, uh, are there other airplanes in, near me, or am I flying in restricted airspace, or you know, how high can I fly, and is there a TFR in place? So all that stuff is really important. So get the Before You Fly app. And then it talks a little bit in that section about LANIC, which is the authorization that you'll need if you want to fly in controlled airspace. All right, so that's the first section. The second section talks about preparing to fly, and they're trying to reemphasize in that section that you need to check your drone, you need to make sure you're ready to fly, that you haven't been drinking, you haven't been doing drugs, you're not of, of weird sort of mind at that point, you want to be cognizant of what you're doing, you want to understand the weather, you understand your surroundings, situational awareness, I've talked about this ad nauseum in other clips, situational awareness, knowing where you are, knowing things around you that can cause you problems, is the biggest reason that drones crash, so make sure you understand that. The first section had seven questions in it, the second section has six questions in it, and that's the second section. The third section talks about the rules, and that has to do with maintaining visual line of sight, not flying over 400 feet above you, understanding what community-based organization guidelines you're flying under. There aren't really any that are published now, so just follow the FAA guidelines. Then the fourth section is about the UAS, about your drone. Understanding before you take off and after you land, inspect your drone, make sure the battery's not swollen, the props aren't nicked up, that you understand that it's working okay, you have any kind of connection issues with your drone the next time you fly, and there are five questions in that. So essentially you've got seven questions for the first one, six questions for the second, uh, section three has five questions and five at the end. So 23 all told, I guess that's 23, that's 23. All right, so let me talk about the prep now. Now if you, uh, and I, I've already put uh, a lot of information in front of you, but the prep section is gonna go through each of the 23 questions really quickly, and I'm not gonna give you the answers because that's kind of defeating the whole purpose of the test. Probably I'm violating some federal rule by doing that, but what I will do is give you some things to keep in mind that will help you answer these questions as you go through the quiz. The first section has seven questions in it, and with the first question, you'll need to know the difference between a recreational flyer and a commercial flyer, or a Part 107 flyer. And basically, a recreational flyer flies for fun, and a commercial flyer flies for money. The second question has to do with controlled versus uncontrolled airspace, and you'll need to understand the differences between those two. Again, controlled airspace is anywhere near a sensitive facility, like a prison, a military establishment, or an airport, and uncontrolled airspace is everywhere else. The third question, you'll need to understand what a TFR is, and that's a temporary flight restriction, and when they might be issued. Those are important to understand, like if a president's coming into town, or maybe there's a fire someplace and they want to restrict the amount of drones that can fly near that, that's what a TFR is all about. Question number four, know about the airspace where you're flying using an app that supports LANIC like before you fly. Again, that's super important to understand if you're in an area that a TFR has been issued, or if you're in a sensitive area where you can't actually take off. With question number five, you'll need to understand how to get authorization for controlled airspace through Atlantic app or drone zone. And you can do that while you're on location, or you can do it from your computer before you leave if you know where you'll be flying. With question number six, remember that controlled airspace is normally found near critical areas like power plants and airports and other sensitive locations. With question number seven, Always stay under 400 feet AGL, which is above ground level, when flying your drone. Anything over that, you'll be violating the FAA regulations. Section 2 has six questions, and the first one deals with you as a pilot. You want to make sure that you always stay laser focused when you're flying your drone, and situational awareness is critical in avoiding accidents. And really what that's speaking to is you as a pilot understanding where you are, what hazards are around you, and what other aircraft might enter your airspace. 
Question number two, remember to inspect your drone before and after every flight to keep it safe. So often when you're flying, you can hit a bug or something up in the air, maybe a tree branch, that'll nick your propellers, and you won't know that unless you inspect it when it lands. Question number three is going to ask you how high you can fly your drone. Now, I've talked about that three or four times already in this clip, so it should be a no-brainer. With question number four, you have to remember that the pilot is ultimately responsible for everything that happens with that drone from takeoff to landing. So if anything happens, whether it's an automatic function or it flew out of control, ultimately you as the pilot are responsible for that. With question number five, remember that just like when you're driving your car or using a boat, medication and alcohol can dramatically alter your perception, and that's a really dangerous situation to get in. With flying, your attitude also comes into play, so never get to a location and be so anxious to get your drone up in the air to capture that perfect shot that you don't take a minute to check your equipment. And with question number six, understand that the wind is one of the largest factors in how a drone flies and can really affect the performance. Sometimes you'll be out there and there'll be no wind at ground level, but as soon as you put the drone up to 200 feet, the wind can really be moving along, so just keep an eye on your controls. Section number three has five questions that mostly deal with the rules. And with question number one, it's important to remember that a pilot must follow the rules of a CBO which is a community-based organization that's typically a flying club that's near you, and it's always a good idea to try and find one that you can fly with, and if they have a published set of rules, print those out and bring those along with you when you go out to fly. With question number two, you have to keep in mind that VLOS, or visual line of sight, is critical for avoiding accidents and must be observed. You always have to keep your drone in your line of sight whenever you're flying to avoid other aircraft. On question number three, all other aircraft have priority when flying near you and you must give them the right away. So if you hear or see an airplane anywhere near you when you're flying, I always recommend to drop down to 50 feet and let that aircraft pass. On question number four, you have to remember that a second person observing your flight does not extend your visual line of sight. You always have to maintain a visual line of sight with you and the observer of your craft when it's up in the air. And finally, on number five, remember that if you're flying FPV, you need a visual observer to watch your flight and they need to be close enough to you for you to be able to hear them. You can't use a phone, you can't use a walkie-talkie. They have to be close enough where if they say, hey Rick, there's a plane coming, you can actually react to that. Section four has five questions as well. And with the first one, it's really important you understand and test any automated features in a safe area before you take it out and fly that drone at 200 feet and use that automated feature. I always recommend flying the drone in your backyard for a long time and making sure you understand how all those automated features work and how the drone will react. With question number two, it's important to read the manuals that came with your drone so you can fly it safe and fully enjoy it. If you don't read the manuals, there may be features or warnings in the manuals that you're not aware of that can affect your flight. On question number three, when you head out to fly, make sure you have your drone registration, your trust certificate, and you know the CBO rules. And my recommendation is put a small folder together, put your registration in there, put your trust certificate in there, and print out the rules from that local CBO club and put those in there as well. And that way you have all your documentation in case you're ever questioned. Question number four, remember to display or mark your FAA registration number on the outside of your drone. You used to be able to put it inside of a battery compartment or in a concealed space, but that was changed about a year ago. And now that registration number needs to be in the outside of your drone. And finally, on question number five, it's important that you know that any drone over 250 grams or 0.55 pounds must be registered with the FAA. And again, that's a very simple process. It takes five minutes. It'll cost you $5 in the U.S. and you have it for three years. And that covers all the drones you're going to fly as a recreational flyer. And that's pretty much it. So again, 23 questions, 23 sections. Everything I just talked about in that prep will prepare you for taking that test and passing that test. And that's all I really had for today. I tried to keep this test short, or this clip short, and actually I think it's longer. You're gonna spend more time watching this than you did taking the test. So hopefully you found this helpful. I'll be back with a ton more stuff this week. So if you haven't subscribed to the channel, hit that subscribe button, because we'd love to have you as part of the Drone Valley family. And until next time, happy flying. Mm -hmm.